Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the April 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of On the Question of a Nationwide Revolution by Lenin from 1907. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and we don't run any ads on this channel, so consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this was originally published in Proletary, number 16, May 2, 1907, and published here according to the Proletary text. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Foreign Languages Publishing House, 1962, Moscow, Volume 12, HTML transcription and markup by R. Symbala, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive at marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Please go support and volunteer for them if you can. So just by way of background, 1907 was over a year after the first Russian Revolution in 1905. This revolution did not succeed at deposing the Tsar or capitalism, but it did extract concessions, reforms, from the Tsar. The Tsar would later be overthrown in February 1917, and then just a few months later that year, October 1917, the Bolsheviks would lead the working class against the provisional government, the bourgeois government. So this is still pretty early in the process, 1907, but after the first Russian Revolution. Let's get into the text. In a certain sense of the word, it is only a nationwide revolution that can be victorious. This is true in the sense that the unity of the overwhelming majority of the population in the struggle for the demands of that revolution is essential for victory to be won. This overwhelming majority must consist either entirely of one class or of different classes that have certain aims in common. It is also true, of course, that the present Russian Revolution can be victorious only if it is nationwide in that specific sense of the word that the conscious participation of the overwhelming majority of the population in the struggle is essential for victory to be won. That, however, is the limit of the conventional truthfulness of the catchword of a nationwide revolution. No further conclusions can be drawn from this concept which is nothing but a truism. Only an overwhelming majority can be victorious over an organized and dominant minority. For this reason, it is fundamentally incorrect and profoundly unmarxist to apply it as a general formula, as a model, a criterion of tactics. The concept of a nationwide revolution should tell the Marxist of the need for a precise analysis of those varied interests of different classes that coincide in certain definite, limited, common aims. Under no circumstances must this concept serve to conceal or overshadow the study of the class struggle in the course of any revolution. Such use of the concept of nationwide revolution amounts to a complete rejection of Marxism and a return to the vulgar phraseology of the petty bourgeois democrats or petty bourgeois socialists. This truth is frequently forgotten by our social democratic right wing. Still more frequently do they forget that class relations in a revolution change with the progress of that revolution. All real revolutionary progress means drawing broader masses into the movement, consequently, a greater consciousness of class interests, consequently, more clearly defined political party groupings, and more precise outlines of the class physiognomy of the various parties, consequently, greater replacement of general, abstract, unclear political and economic demands that are vague in their abstractness by the varying, concrete, clearly defined demands of the different classes. For instance, the Russian bourgeois revolution, like any other bourgeois revolution, inevitably begins under the common slogans of political liberty and popular interests. Only in the course of the struggle, the concrete meanings of these slogans become clear to the masses and to the different classes only to the extent that a practical attempt is made to implement that liberty, to give a definite content even to such a hollow-sounding word as democracy. Prior to the bourgeois revolution, and at its onset, all speak in the name of democracy. The proletariat and the peasantry, together with urban petty bourgeois elements, and the liberal bourgeoisie, together with the liberal landlords. 
It is only in the course of the class struggle, only in the course of a more or less lengthy historical development of the revolution, that the different understanding of this democracy by the different classes is revealed. And what's more, the deep gulf between the interests of the different classes is revealed in their demands for different economic and political measures, in the name of one and the same democracy. Only in the course of the struggle, only as the revolution develops, is it revealed that one democratic class or stratum does not want to go, or cannot go, as far as another, that while, quote, common, or allegedly common, objectives are being achieved, Fierce skirmishes develop around the method by which they are to be achieved, for example, on the degree, extent, or consistency of freedom and power of the people, or the manner in which land is to be transferred to the peasantry, etc. We have had to recall all these forgotten truths so as to enable the reader to understand the dispute that recently took place between two newspapers. This is what one of them, Narodnaya Gazeta, wrote against the other, Nasha Echo. Quote, the grouping of the population by party, wrote Nasha Echo, that important political lesson and the revolution's most important political acquisition at the time of the elections to the Second Duma showed clearly by nationwide facts that broad strata of the landlords and bourgeoisie are swinging to the right. Quite true. But the mood and the mandates which the left deputies, socialist revolutionaries, Trudeviks, and popular socialists have brought with them from their localities, also, quote, showed clearly on a nationwide scale that the people are at present steeped in cadet constitutional illusions to a considerable degree, that the people place excessive hopes on the independent activities of the Duma, that they're excessively concerned with saving the Duma. Comment, what is the Duma? So, out of the 1905 revolution against the Tsar, which was not complete, the Tsar stayed in power, but it was a very big successful, meaningful uprising. A number of concessions and reforms were extracted. One of them was the founding of a parliament. This was the Duma. So it was more than merely advisory, but there were huge checks on what it could do, and the Tsar still retained an enormous amount of power. The Marxists at times ran candidates for seats in the Duma, and at other times boycotted it, depending on the situation. You can find other writings from Lenin about that. Anyway, continuing. That is the obvious fact that the Nasha Echo writers failed to notice. They did notice whom the people sent to the Duma, but not what they were sent there for. But in that case, will Nasha Echo not agree that, in proposing that the proletariat ignore nationwide tasks, it is proposing that it isolate itself, not only from bourgeois society, but also from the petty bourgeois people." Unquote. This is an extremely instructive and noteworthy tirade which conceals three major opportunist errors. First, the results of the elections are contrasted with the mood of the deputies, which is substituting the deputies' mood for that of the people, and reverting from the more profound, extensive, and basic to the shallower, narrower, and derivative. Footnote here. As far as, quote, mandates are concerned, we reject that argument completely. Who makes account of revolutionary and opportunist instructions and mandates? Who does not know how many newspapers have been suppressed for publishing revolutionary instructions? There's a note from Lenin. Back to the text. Secondly, the question of a firm and sustained political line and tactics for the proletariat is replaced by the question of an assessment of some mood or another. Thirdly, and this is most important, for the sake of the vulgarly democratic fetish of a, quote, nationwide revolution, the proletariat is scared with the bogey of, quote, isolation from the, quote, petty bourgeois people. We shall deal with the first two errors as briefly as possible. The elections affected the masses and showed not only their fleeting mood, but their profound interests. It is altogether unworthy of Marxists to revert from class interests, expressed by the party grouping at the elections, to a fleeting mood. The mood of the deputies may be one of gloom, while the economic interests of the masses may call forth a mass struggle. An assessment of mood, therefore, may be necessary to determine the moment for some action, step, appeal, etc., but certainly not to determine proletarian tactics. To argue differently would mean replacing sustained proletarian tactics by unprincipled dependence on mood. 
and all the time, the point at issue was that of a line, and had nothing to do with a moment. Whether or not the proletariat has at present recovered, and Narodnaya Gazeta does not think so, is of importance in deciding the moment for action, but not in determining the tactical line of action of the working class. The third error is the most profound and the most important, the fear of isolating the social democrats or the proletariat, which is the same thing, from the petty bourgeois people. That is really a most improper fear. Social democracy must isolate itself from the petty bourgeois people inasmuch as the socialist revolutionaries, Trudeviks and popular socialists, are really trailing along in the wake of the constitutional democrats. And that is happening, and indeed has happened, very frequently, beginning with the voting for Golovin and continuing with the famous tactics of sepulchral silence, etc. For there must be one of two things. Either the vacillation of the petty bourgeoisie is, in general, an indication of the shaky nature of the petty bourgeois and the difficult and arduous development of the revolution, but does not signify that it has ended or that its forces are exhausted, which is our opinion. Then, by isolating itself from all and every vacillation and wavering in petty bourgeois people, the social democratic parliament educates them for the struggle, trains them in preparation for the struggle, and develops their political consciousness, determination, firmness, etc. Or else, the wavering of the petty bourgeois people means the finale of the present bourgeois revolution. We believe such a view to be wrong, and none of the social democrats have directly and openly defended it, although extreme right-wing social democrats are undoubtedly inclined to do so. Then again, the social democratic parliament must also isolate itself from the wavering, or treachery, of the petty bourgeoisie, in order to educate the working class masses in class consciousness, and prepare them for a more planned, firm, and decisive participation in the next revolution. In both cases, and in all cases, the social democratic proletariat must isolate itself from the petty bourgeois people, which is steeped in cadet illusions, the cadets were the main bourgeois party, and do so unconditionally. The proletariat must in all cases pursue the firm, sustained policy of a truly revolutionary class, without allowing itself to be flustered by any reactionary or philistine cock-and-bull stories, whether these are about nationwide tasks in general or about a nationwide revolution. It is possible that, given a certain combination of forces or a concurrence of unfavorable conditions, the overwhelming part of the bourgeois and petty bourgeois strata may be infected, for the time being, with servility, slavishness, or cowardice. That would be nationwide cowardice, and the social democratic proletariat isolates itself from it in the interests of the working class movement as a whole. So that's the end of the audiobook, and as usual, Lenin has done it again, or did it again, back in 1907. Uh, what do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion there. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. We don't run any ads on this channel, so your support through Patreon is important. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They are also materially helpful, so appreciate those very much. Otherwise, engagement helps. Liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting on the videos, even if it's just thanks or good video, all of that helps to boost the channel, helps more people to more easily stumble across this content. Channel is socialism for all. We're trying to make this content as accessible as we can. Your engagement helps future audience members who have yet to stumble across the channel. Thank you for making their task easier because people have questions about politics, about the economy, about their jobs. And we're trying to help arm people with knowledge in the struggle for working class liberation. So on that note, don't forget to join an organization. All the agitation and online education in the world can only take you so far. Eventually, you have to get organized where you live, connect with other class conscious working class people, and start to work on the problems that are facing the working class in your area. That said, thanks again, and we will catch you in the next video.